Hey everyone, I want to take some time to talk about the updated edition of the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, or NRSV. It's due to be released November 18th. The NRSV is my primary translation, and I read from it regularly, so this update is of particular interest to me. Now, I want to be clear up front that my discussion will largely consist of speculation and opinion based on publicly available information. I don't have any insider information or know anything that you don't. I, I wish I did, I, but I don't. But with that said, I have given some serious thought to what we might expect and what I would like to see in this update, and I'm hoping some others may find it interesting and share their own thoughts on this update as well. So, let's get into it, and absolutely, if you have anything to share, please do so in the comments. What you see here in front of the camera is a 1991 New Oxford Annotated Bible that uh, many of us call the, New the Noab 2, second edition. And this came out two years after the NRSV was released in 1989. This is the first update since then, and the update is being managed by Friendship Press, the National Council of Churches, and the Society for Biblical Literature. There's not a lot of information available concerning the update, but what little there is largely comes from the Friendship Press website. Uh, so I'll be referring to that site and uh, a few others throughout this video. Any websites I refer to will be linked in the video description below, so check that out if you're wanting to know more and see these for yourself. And the first thing I want to discuss is the name of the new edition. Friendship Press has been referring to it as the NRSV Updated Edition. And initially, that was being abbreviated as NRSV-UE, all capital letters. And in my humble opinion, it isn't particularly attractive. But more recently, I've noticed they're now using NRSV-UE with NRSV, all capital, as it has been, and UE in lowercase uh, as the acronym instead. I think that's a little nicer, and it has the benefit of making it pronounceable. When I saw it, I immediately found myself saying Nurse View. And I suspect that isn't an accident. I think they may have realized that such a long acronym needs to be easy to say, and that seems to solve the problem. Are there better options? Oh, well, I'm not sure. I think NRSVU could work. It has the benefit of being pronounceable as Nurse View, but with one less letter. At the same time, it also kind of looks like the acronym for university, like something that should be on sweatshirts. So I'm not sure how great a solution that is. I've also wondered if readers may come to refer to the two editions as the NRSV 89 and 21, similar to how we differentiate other translations like the NIV and the NASB. That one now concludes the 77, 95, and 2020. I think that would be my preference. I just like NRSV, and making it Nurse View just doesn't sound quite right to me. But I may just be stuck in my ways. It'll be interesting to see how most people come to refer to it. But, okay, the name isn't all that important. What really matters is how the translation itself will be changed with the new update. What can we expect? Well, Friendship Press has a summary on their website that states the update is focused on three key areas. I'm going to look at each one and expound on them a bit. The first area that the translation is focused on is text critical and philological advances. And it states, the primary focus of the 30 year review is on new text critical and philological considerations that affect the English translation. The publication of the majority of Judean desert biblical texts and fragments has led to a revolution in understanding readings that differ from medieval Hebrew traditions in the Masoretic text, which was the basis of the new revised standard version. So right away we see this is the primary focus of the update. Uh, it mentions the Judean desert biblical texts and fragments. Uh, that would be, to most of us, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it notes the NRSV is based on the Masoretic text, as most English translations of the Old Testament are, although, you know, I, I think pretty much all are going to have variations in, in some places based on Septuagint or other textual evidence, but by and large, Masoretic text reigns. 
Now, the current NRSV already benefits some from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It, uh, it does contain some readings that uh, come from it, and there's one big one we're going to discuss. Uh, I'm going to show you an introduction to 1 Samuel from this book, the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible. This is an, it's an older book, but still a very interesting book if you really want to get into details about Dead Sea Scrolls readings and how they differ from the Masoretic Text and the Septuagint. Uh, this isn't really something you can sit down and just read the Bible. It's more something to use alongside in a Bible to see where differences occur. And uh, a lot occur in First and Second Samuel. We're looking at the introduction to Samuel in the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible now. And it mentions that uh, some of the variants involve individual words or phrases. Intermittently, there are whole sentences either left out of the Masoretic Text by mistake or added by the scrolls as supplementary material. Arguably, the single most dramatic passage among the newly discovered biblical scrolls occurs in 4Q Sam at the beginning of 1 Samuel 11, an entire paragraph missing from all our Bibles for 2,000 years has now been restored in the New Revised Standard Version. And uh, so we're going to look at that. Uh, here we are in chapter 10, verse 27 of 1 Samuel in the NRSV. And what you see is at the end of verse 27, they've appended this section starting at now Nahash, king of the Ammonites. That comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. That is the verse that was being spoken of that had been missing. It is not found uh, in the Masoretic text or the Septuagint. And here we see on the next page, there's the rest of it. I'll let you read that yourself. And down. Here in the footnotes, or in the notes of the uh, New Oxford, this is the fifth edition. It says the paragraph explains the reason for the conflict in chapter 11. So that's where the value of that comes from and why the NRSV chose to include it. Uh, they also note in the footnote to compare it with evidence in Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, which uh, backs up including that. So I shared this because uh, it's interesting, even though this is something that was added 30 years ago, uh, there's still a lot of translations that do not include it. Uh, the NRSV has it, the CEB, Common English Bible, has it, the NLT has it, but in brackets. And uh, I did see in that Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, they mentioned the New American Bible, NAB, had it footnoted. So I wonder if that got included in the, uh, in the neighbor, N-A-B-R-E. Uh, I don't know. I'm not very familiar with Catholic translations, so if anyone out there knows, I'd, I'd love to hear. But uh, there are other major translations that do not include it. The ESV and the NASB do not have it. So, you know, I think it's notable that the NRSV is very open to including a Dead Sea Scrolls reading where other translations haven't been. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what other evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls makes its way into the updated edition. I'm looking forward to that. On the New Testament side, I expect to see some changes resulting from updates to the UBS Greek New Testament that underlies this and many other English translations. That's what you're looking at right now. It's open to uh, the Gospel of John. In particular, there have been several changes made to the Catholic or general epistles since the NRSV was originally published. This includes the books of James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st through 3rd John, and Jude. These changes are the result of a new approach to textual criticism called the Coherence-Based Genealogical Method, or CBGM. How this works and what it means for textual criticism is well beyond the scope of this video and honestly well beyond my very limited knowledge of the subject. I, I can't even read this except for a few words here and there. So yeah, we're not going to get too nerdy. Uh, much of it has little to no effect on the English translation of the Bible anyways. But there are a few changes that are more significant uh, which may find their way into the updated NRSV. And from what I can gather, the most significant is probably 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. So we're going to look at that. Okay, here we are. We're looking at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, 
and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. And we have a footnote. There's a textual variant. Other ancient authorities read, will be burned up. And if you know your KJV or NKJV, uh, that will sound familiar. That's how they have that and uh, some other translations as well. Uh, modern translations uh, tend to have something more like will be disclosed, revealed, uh, found, something like that. Uh, we're going to look now at the CSB because it's been updated in recent years, and we'll see it has a footnote that uh, gets to the what is in the updated UBS Greek New Testament. Okay, and we're looking at it now in the CSB. This is the 2017 CSB, but it's the same in the 2020 at this verse. And we see it ends with, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. And you see there are two footnotes, B and C, uh, one being what we saw before will be burned up, but the other notes, some Syriac and Coptic manuscripts read, will not be found. So instead of will be found, will not be found. And that is the change that is in the UBS 5th edition and that we may see in the updated NRSV. Now, the CSB clearly relegated it to the footnotes rather than accepting it, and this has been consistent with what other translations updated since the UBS 5 have done, such as the ESV and NASB. In a 2018 post on his blog, Jeff Riddle wrote about this change, which he disagrees with, and speculated that the updated NRSV would be the first to accept it. I think he's probably right. The NRSV and the RSV before it have been more willing to embrace contemporary biblical scholarship than other major translations, especially when it's something that could have a big uh, theological impact or that may cause controversy. The translation of Isaiah 7.14 is a well-known and much maligned example. I expect the NRSV UE, or Nurse View, will represent this change in its translation of 2 Peter 3.10, and that the uh, other major variants will be included in the footnotes. Okay, the second item pertains to the textual notes, the, the footnotes like we were just looking at. And it says, SBL's initial review of the NRSV suggested that the current text-critical footnotes are incomplete and inconsistent. In some cases, the translation adds words not conspicuously in the sources or fails to indicate when a reading is not following the sources. Reviewers will be asked to identify text-critical issues that should have been documented in the notes, but were not. This is great. I am someone who often reads the footnotes, frequently checking for variant translations like we just saw in 2 Peter 3.10 and literal renderings of paraphrastic verses. Uh, a great example is uh, 1 Timothy verses 1 and 2. Okay, so here we are. This saying is sure. Whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. And we see there's a footnote or overseer. So there's an alternate translation of bishop. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, etc. Married only once has a note as well. And we see in the Greek, it is literally the husband of one wife. So the NRSV has chosen to paraphrase this, uh, change the meaning a little, perhaps. I'll, I'll let you decide for yourself. But we do get a literal rendering down here, which is important because uh, when we're doing a very deep study or very careful study of the Bible, we want to be aware of these things. So... Where is the NRSV lacking in the footnotes? Well, CatholicBibleTalk.com has a brief article concerning the update. Uh, they indicated they spoke to a general editor who asked to remain anonymous, and one of their questions was regarding the lack of footnotes where singular pronouns are converted to plural. I think that's a great question, and it's definitely a shortcoming of the footnotes that these changes are not identified, and it happens quite a bit in the NRSV. A Psalm 1 Verse 1 is a great example. 
So look here. So here we are in verse 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. And we see this is in plural here, happier those. However, the, the underlying Hebrew text is in the singular, and we see that represented in the New King James Version here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, this is the New King James uh, Version Study Bible, second edition, and it does note the Hebrew word for man in this context means person without reference to gender. So the, uh, the gender-inclusive translation is perfectly valid, but we don't realize, looking at the NRSV, that it has gone from a singular to plural by saying uh, happy are those. Um, they could have done perhaps happy is the one instead, but maybe that would seem impersonal. I don't know. Here's the NET translation, and it actually does go with the one. How blessed is the one who does not follow the advice of the wicked. So here we have the singular while retaining a gender-inclusive translation. Uh, they do note, which is interesting, that the plural is okay. One could translate the collective singular with the plural those, both here and in verses 2 through 3, where singular pronouns and verbal forms are utilized in the Hebrew text, confer NRSV. Uh, and, you know, and I agree, I don't think it's a bad translation how the NRSV has it. Um, they further note, However, here the singular form may emphasize the godly individuals are usually outnumbered by the wicked. Retaining the singular allows the translation to retain this emphasis. And I think that's what we miss out when we have that change, but we don't have a note to indicate it to us. Uh, being unaware of it, we can't have an interpretation like this that uh, we might get if we had known. Unfortunately, it seems these types of changes will still not be footnoted in the new edition of the NRSV. Uh, going back to the article from Catholic Bible Talk, the editor stated as far as they know, there will not be footnotes added for these types of changes. If that's true, it's quite unfortunate and a big disservice to the readers. I would really love to see these sorts of changes footnoted so that those doing a careful study of the text can be aware of them. The final thing that Friendship Press includes in their summary of changes is style and rendering, and it states the translation philosophy of the NRSV will be maintained, including its overarching commitment to being as literal as possible and adhering to the ancient texts, and only as free as necessary to make the meaning clear in graceful, understandable English. That being said, if a reviewer judges a particular translation awkward, inaccurate, or difficult for general readers to understand, the reviewer may suggest a more elegant rendering. I've seen a few people online who've been concerned about this, and it does seem like an area which could cause some anxiety for those of us who hope that the NRSV updated edition will still be recognizable as the NRSV. The article I mentioned earlier from CatholicBibleTalk.com indicates that it is expected to be a, quote, light update and not a wholesale reworking of the text. If that's true, then it seems it should still be recognizable as the NRSV, and those of us who use it need not worry. And that's good to hear. Personally, I've used the NRSV long enough myself to know there are some passages that I would render differently if it were up to me. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 comes to mind. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? We see there is a more literal rendering of the Greek in the footnotes. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And the HarperCollins Study Bible here uh, calls that the preferred text and notes that the pearl the plural pronouns here are actually masculine singular in the Greek, facilitating a Christological reading of the psalm. Uh, I, too, prefer the more literal rendering as it leaves this open to be interpreted, where the NRSV is taking a specific interpretation here in the translation. And there's more we could talk about here, and that gets into more than just style. Um, 
and could get into a long conversation about how we should interpret this verse, but that's an example of something uh, that I would change in the NRSV if I could. <clears throat> I kind of suspect this will not uh, be changed in the new version. I would suspect it may remain, but I could be wrong. We're looking at Song of Solomon, chapter 1, specifically verse 13 here. And this is an example of something very minor that could stand to be updated in the NRSV. But uh, again, very minor. And what we see is, My beloved is to me a bag of myrrh that lies between my breasts. And the word here we're interested in is bag. This isn't something I would have given much thought to, except I read something in Robert Alter's book, The Art of Bible Translation, recently. And in that book, he mentions that this should really be like a pouch or sachet. It's a small bag. It's Bag is just like, sounds big. And I, I kind of agree with him. When I think bag, I think of like a grocery bag or a trash bag. It's something large and bulky which is not what's in view here. Here is the same verse in Robert Alter's translation, and we see that he goes with sachet. And that matches several other translations, including the CEB, CSB, Neighbor, and NLT. I think that's a good choice. Uh, another option might be bundle, which I think that might be used in the King James. Uh, I think it would be smart for the updated NRSV to use a word that better conveys the image of a small pouch or sachet instead of just saying bag. Uh, but again, you know, I'm just including this to give a simple example of where word choice and style is important. It's not a big deal if they don't change it. So, as I stated earlier, the NRSV updated edition is expected November 18th. Will I run right out and pick one up when it's available? Um, I maybe not. I'm I'm gonna have to see how much it changes and how compelling the update is. I'm, you know, I've already got lots of Bibles. Uh, I have heard that the Harper Collins Study Bible may be updated with the NRSV UE. If that's the case, I think that is something I might be very interested in getting. This hasn't been updated since 2006, and this is a very beat-up paperback copy. I bought it at a library sale, so yeah, it'd be nice to upgrade that. I'm sure the new Oxford will get an update at some point, too, but uh, I've got the 5th edition. I think that just came out in 2018, so not in a big hurry to uh, upgrade that. I've got a nice copy of it, and I'm still uh, learning from it. Another question I've considered is, will the updated NRSV replace the current NRSV for me in my study and reading of the Bible? And I'm not sure I can say, though, immediately, no, it won't, because I'm just too invested in the current version of the translation. I've got study Bibles like the HarperCollins. I've got the new Oxford, this nice leather edition. I've got the Cambridge Reference Bible in goatskin. I'm not buying another one of those anytime soon. That was very expensive. I got the Journaling Bible. I recently acquired a thin line. I've got the Hour by Hour Prayer Book, which uses the NRSV. I got just so much NRSV stuff. I got more study Bibles than this. It's, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm pretty well happy with what I have. It's taken me time and some investment to acquire these things. I'm not going to replace them all because the translation updated. Um, the other thing is I've just become very familiar with a lot of renderings in the NRSV, especially in the Psalms and some other places where I've prayed them a lot because of this hour by hour prayer book or because I've just read through them a lot. So for now, I'm kind of hoping there will be a compelling study Bible that comes out uh, fairly soon in the updated edition. Like I say, I'd love to see the HarperCollins get an update since it's been a while. And I'll probably use it as a reference work for a while, looking at how things have changed from the current NRSV to the updated edition and making notes in my journaling Bible and elsewhere as uh, things catch my attention. 
And uh, over time, who knows, I may find that the changes are very good, I like them, and I may slowly move to using the updated edition more. That time will tell. Uh, but for now, I'll probably be using the current edition a lot and uh, kind of seeing what comes out in the updated edition. I do have a few kind of dream Bibles I would like to see that could come out in the updated edition. And uh, I think I'll share that in a future video along with any further thoughts I have or feedback I receive regarding this video. So, what do you think? Are you excited for the updated NRSV? Concerned? Happy? Sad? What do you think should change? What should remain the same? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to discuss it. I'm very curious to hear what others think about the update to this translation that we all use and love. I hope you found this informative and helpful. If you did, please click like to let me know. As always, if you'd like to see more, please consider subscribing. I thank you for watching. God bless, and have a wonderful day.